Tonight's congressional hearing on the insurrection may recount and relive that day for many Americans. And that has value. But let's be clear. That's not enough. The special committee was created to do more than that, explicitly to establish the facts of what happened to inform potential policy and potential punishment, which is one way to deter such future attacks. So by the end of these six hearings, the committee has a duty to try to answer the larger questions, which is our special report right now to end the hour. The questions. Was the January 6 events initially a gathering that then got out of control, or were they a specifically planned attack? And was the effort to stop certifying then-president-elect Biden's win a kind of feudal series of machinations by random politicos or part of an organized attempted coup by the incumbent outgoing president? One of the committee's main avenues to answer these questions involves going to the source and interviewing people, just as journalists interview sources during and after momentous events, something we've done right here on MSNBC. And the statements and admissions of Trump's own aides have shown what may not have been apparent in the weeks after Trump lost in November, that public complaints and far-fetched lawsuits were not one final performative grievance that led to what you see here. No, they overlapped with and morphed into actual plans to overthrow Trump's lawful final loss. It's something we asked a Trump lawyer about back at the time. Our strategy is to make sure that we continue to challenge all of these uh, false and fraudulent results. This election was stolen by mail-in ballots. We'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. The president is still involved in ongoing litigation related to the election. What is the point of all this? <laughs> well, the point of this, of course, is to get to fair and accurate results because the election was stolen and President Trump won by a landslide. Now, let's be precise. Some of what those Trump lawyers said and did was legal. You can file lawsuits with no basis. They're called frivolous lawsuits. They're generally legally pointless. But that's not a crime. That is allowed. But notice the goals were moving even then. In that interview, Ms. Ellis, the lawyer, started pushing that they wanted their own results to show a Trump, quote, landslide, which did not happen. So Congress must probe how that became a potentially illegal conspiracy to commit voter fraud and elector fraud and install fraudulent electors who they thought might somehow override a state's entire lawful vote in the states that Biden won. Now, that goes beyond frivolous lawsuits, trying to seat fraudulent electors for the January 6th certification, while then-President Trump openly demanded Mike Pence reject the Biden electors for basically any reason they could make up. Did you ever make calls like that regarding what you're calling these alternate electors? Yes, I was part of the process to make sure there were alternate electors. We fought to see the electors. Um, the Trump campaign asked us to do that. With the undersigned being the duly elected and qualified electors, we hereby certify the following. For President um, Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida, number of votes, 11. New pressure from President Trump on Vice President Mike Pence to reject the electors. The vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. It's not fraudulent electors, Ari. It's alternate electors. Because of the process, again, that's laid out in the Constitution under the 12th Amendment. The last admission you heard there is from Giuliani's deputy, Boris Epstein, a Trump campaign lawyer, copping to a plot reported in January by Rachel Maddow and other journalists that is now under investigation by both Congress, we may hear about it tonight, and the Justice Department. That plot goes way beyond pressuring Mike Pence to magically declare Trump the winner, something Pence and his own lawyer knew was not constitutional, and they said so at the time. It goes beyond that. It goes to a plot that would appear to come from inside the Trump White House, recruiting lawmakers to stop or just sort of delay the certification of then-president-elect Biden's win. Now, think about that. I was just very careful to note some of what was being done then might have seemed fanciful and ridiculous, but was lawful. Mr. Giuliani can file baseless lawsuits. People can talk and lie about the results of the election in public. In public, the First Amendment protects all kinds of speech, including lies, most of the time. 
But when you start having meetings of fraudulent electors in concert with other individuals in the White House and the president formally publicly calling to seat fraudulent electors, that's voter fraud. That's elector fraud. That's why the word fraud keeps coming up. Now, part of this attack on democracy is not even contested. There are Trump aides who admit it. One was just indicted last week. Indeed, the only contested part would, according to them, sometimes boil down to whether to call overthrowing democracy a sweep or a coup. We had uh, over 100 congressmen and senators on Capitol Hill ready to implement the sweep. A dozen senators now saying they will object, at least in some form, to the, to the votes on the Electoral College. We believe that if the votes were sent back to those battleground states, most or all of those states would decertify the election. Several Republican members of Congress and senators egged on by President Trump and his false claims of electoral fraud in this election are going to object. Do you realize you are describing a coup? No. No. To Mr. Navarro, it was a sweep. Mr. Navarro, like Mr. Bannon, is someone who has pushed harder, more vehemently in public to both overthrow the election at the time and to defend that act afterward, a kind of a public laundering, if you want to call it that, to say this could have worked and it could have been lawful or constitutional. Now, what else do those two have in common? They've both been indicted for going farther to defy the Congress and the investigation than just about anyone else, including Trump's own family members. So what might have initially looked fanciful or extreme or even like just poor judgment in the public square has started to look like something else if their hands were on the plot that intersected with Trump's calls to find any excuse, no matter how thin, out of court to overthrow the electors. So tonight's hearing digs into that. Congress has to probe who else was in on Mr. Navarro's admitted plot. And if the evidence shows it was his own rogue dream, okay, that would be good news for Donald Trump. But if it shows that the former president directed this and directed trying to seat fraudulent electors and directed a plot to commit massive voter fraud in Georgia and elsewhere, that starts to build evidence of a criminal conspiracy. The government, Attorney General Garland, always has an obligation to indict leaders of criminal conspiracies, no matter who they are. Not because of who they are, but no matter who they are. And that's the question hanging over these hearings. Is there evidence linking all these pieces into that orchestrated plot? Then there's the violence. Now, in all fairness, there were certainly people who went to that day's rally just to be at a rally, to protest, to exercise free speech. And remember, most Trump rallies did not turn into insurrections, so it could have been a reasonable expectation for some people that they were going to a rally, just a rally. But the Justice Department is already indicting others with sometimes damning evidence that there was this plan for the most serious crime possible against the government, sedition. And then there's this new video out today showing, well, let's take a look at how we've pressed some of those organizers of that rally. My role that day was the, uh, similar to my role at other events, where it had been to assist many others in organizing and executing a professional and lawfully obtained, like, permitted event there at the White House Ellipse. The subpoenas seek planning and funding records, including any coordination with the Trump White House. Roger Stone, a confidant of former President Donald Trump, flanked by men wearing insignias of a militia group. Eleven people tied to the events and rallies that took place before the insurrection. Create a crowd that would then be leveraged to facilitate the riots. We knew what kind of logistics it took to move a crowd of that size. Would you ever vote for him again? I'll, I'll definitely be looking to support somebody else in the Republican mm. primaries. Alleging the attack was part of a broad and well-organized conspiracy. A broad conspiracy. We know it was for Donald Trump's benefit. Was he in on it? That is the big question that hangs over tonight. And it's a question of evidence, not politics. The Republican Party has been hardening its line about the facts of January 6th. 
If you remember, there was a time when it was a big deal and then it wasn't. And then it became outright sympathy with rioters. But let's remember, because if there was ever a night to do this together, it is tonight, at least that's according to the government, let's remember the shock when this all happened. And think about what we've now learned, and you don't usually get this, I could tell you in journalism, you usually get this behind the scenes stuff, what top Republicans were telling their colleagues in that month of January, that they too had to get to the bottom of what happened. Take a listen. We cannot just sweep this under the rug. We need to know why it happened, who did it, and people need to be held accountable for it. And I'm committed to make sure that happens. What we learned is that people can get in. We learned that people planned. Um, we need to have all the facts, especially for all of us, and we should do it in a bipartisan manner. Wow. That's what Kevin McCarthy was privately saying. It's this thing in politics that sometimes happens where people are actually seemingly better in private, but then the nature of their soulless need to stay on top of whatever their base says has made them act worse in public, or eventually maybe they internalize it. Now, they're politicians. We hold them responsible for what they do. They don't get extra credit for what they privately mused about potentially doing. McCarthy went on to, of course, vote against the very thing he privately thought was necessary a few days after the insurrection, which was a bipartisan probe. Now Republicans are denying that there even was an insurrection. Mitch McConnell, though, I want you to see this tonight, admitted it was exactly that on the 6th of January. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. Wow. That's Mitch McConnell that night. That's what he or his aides realized had happened, and he decided to say it, and he said it on the Senate floor. That is now controversial and anathema inside his own party. Indeed, you're going to hear people tonight who say what he said then, and many of them will be Democrats because so many Republicans bailed on the committee, and then you're going to hear Republicans oppose that when that's what their leader McConnell was saying on the Senate floor. And other Senate Republicans also, in those moments, speaking out about exactly the truth of what they knew about why that Senate floor on which they spoke that night, why it was stormed. We will not be kept out of this chamber by thugs, mobs, or threats. We do not encourage what happened today. My heartfelt gratitude goes out to the Capitol Hill police who valiantly defended our building and our lives. We will not bow to lawlessness or intimidation. Violence is not how you achieve change. Violence is not how you achieve something better. Chaos, anarchy. The violence today was wrong and un-American. We had police officers, the men and women that we walk by every single day with riot gear getting spit on and attacked. Mob rule is not going to prevail here. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Those were all Senate Republicans I just showed you. Why do they sound so different now, and why does that matter? Now, as promised, we bring in our guests on all of this. Justice correspondent for The Nation, Ellie Mistal, and an Emmy Award-winning TV producer, writer, and now progressive advocate, Michael Hirshhorn. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Michael, I'm going to start with you because for years you produce uh, reality TV. We've mentioned that before as either a credential or a caveat for some viewers for you. Yes. Is that fair? Fair enough. Um, but what you were very good at and sought after was producing all kinds of riveting television. Now you work on a lot of progressive advocacy. We've talked to you about gun reform. We've talked to you about progressive organizing. And so you seem like a great person to assess what I just showed. How much has changed on the floor of that very body that was breached and how that fits into the story um, that the Congress is trying to tell tonight? Right. Well, I think I think part, part, before I even start, part mm -hmm. of the problem has been the reality TVization of politics and of journalism, right? And the Republicans, I think, have been very smart about storytelling in a way that the Democrats have not been smart about storytelling. So, what's interesting about tonight is can these hearings really recapture the story? and take it away from, from the fake news and from the other outlets that are trying to use distraction to sort of change the subject and to distract us from what's actually happening and what happened. What makes a story break through? It's very tough to say. I mean, in, in my world, and I think also in politics, it's casting. 
it's the right person. It was John Dean. It was Joseph Welsh, if you go back to 1954 and the Army McCarthy hearings. Have um, you no decency, sir? Have you no decency? It's the Which right Jay-Z person. sampled on 444, one of the only congressional hearings to ever be sampled. F really good point. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, absolutely, I, I absolutely defer to you on that one. Um, it, it, it's, it's the right person saying the right thing at the right time. So before I bring in Ellie, to that point, from your perspective, do you see any such witnesses yet? I don't know, and I and I, I hope that person is there, and they're hiding that person because surprise is also key. And and mm. if they're smart, and if they're also former head of ABC News who's producing this as a televised event is smart, we are going to be surprised. Mm. And surprise is everything in narrative. Fascinating. So that brings us to Ellie on the legal perspective. You followed this very closely. Let's be clear: the government, the committee, touts this as a prime time hearing. That's not a constitutional concept, and it's not a congressional concept. It is a television concept, and it's also people around this committee saying they saw what happened to the Mueller report fizzling, and they are going to present this to the public through the television tonight. Your view on how to do that. Yeah, well, there's really an audience of one here, right? And that audience is Merrick Garland. Because at the end of this hearing, at the end of these hearings, at the, what we have to have is Merrick Garland watching this thing at home and being like, you know what? Crimes have been committed, and the American public will stand for nothing less than the dogged prosecution of those crimes. And that's why we need to do it on television. That's why we need to have, to have people kind of uh, uh, ready. But here's the other thing, Ari. As you say, th this is a, what happened to the Mueller report, really? Part of that is a media failure. And we have to be prepared, I think, in the media to not fail again. Right? What we are witnessing is one of the biggest acts of American political cowardice. In, in, in the history of this country, all right? We have McCarthy, we have McConnell, we have these Republicans whose lives were in danger, who have then turned around and sided with their abuser, sided with the person who sent people to either kill them or certainly bully them into doing what he wanted, right? Now these Republicans turn around and say, like, oh, the committee's not bipartisan. They had an opportunity Right. To participate. They had an opportunity. There's a reason why this is a House committee and not a joint session of Congress committee. Right. And it's because Mitch McConnell refused to participate. And the media has to remember who was willing to show up for the American government and who wasn't whenever these Republicans make their comments about how the committee is stacked in a partisan nature. You're bringing up such an important point. I want to get into it. We sometimes say around here, fact check to what you just said about the goals of the individuals there. Fact check. True. They wanted to kill anyone who is upholding democracy. We live in a world where this has been now been repolarized as if it were partisan. But what's striking to the facts, and we have to see tonight and in these hearings how it comes out, is to your point, they wanted to kill Mike Pence. They said so. They wanted to kill and hurt Nancy Pelosi. They said so. And there's new video on that today. It wasn't even about teams. Of course, killing people, murder is wrong. If the party can't deal with that, they've got bigger problems. And what we just showed in the introduction to you was that to, to a line, every senator in the Republican Party who spoke that night said that stuff. It was bad. So if they've moved this far away, what is the truthful obligation of those with any platform or power to deal with that? Because you can tell two sides of this story as to what McCarthy's saying today, or you could just say what McCarthy said then, which might be truer. Yeah, I mean, look, the people need to understand how close this happened to they got to succeeding. And as you say, they weren't trying to kill people based on partisan lines. They were willing to kill Republicans, too, if they had found them. If Eugene Goodman doesn't heroically lead these people on a wild goose chase throughout the Capitol, congressmen would have been kidnapped, potentially harmed, potentially killed. If staffers don't have the wherewithal to secure the electoral ballots, the physical electoral ballots, and shuttle them to a secure location before the insurrection has ransacked the Senate parliamentarian's office, the election would have been thrown into chaos. And so it's incumbent, I think, not just on the January 6th committee, but on everybody with a voice, on mm. everybody with a platform to refocus the issue on what almost happened to the country and how we stop it from happening again. And I think also to, to the moment you're framing this as how will it affect the midterms, you've already lost. Because that's not the point of these hearings. The point of these hearings, it's a last stand for truth in the demo democratic sphere, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a battle to establish 
facts and that facts matter um, in a way that allows democracy to continue to function. So in a way, the stakes are much, much higher than what will happen in the midterms, but also it's crucial that journalism and the media not turn everything into a horse race. This is not a horse race. This is an existential moment for this democracy and the hearings that take place over the coming month are going to determine whether we have a democracy in the future or not. Can I ask you a follow-up? Sure. It's your show. Who won the morning? Ha, <laughs> ha, Not falling into that trap. <laughs> um, that's what some of these sort of D.C.-based outlets always do, and that's what they're going to do tonight. So to Michael's point, in conclusion, um, the joke being making fun of us here in the media and the mistakes some of us make, um, what is on your mind to watch tonight? What's the point? We need to know what the president knew and when he knew it, right? There's, there's a debasement that's happened that we can't let be, become normalized, right? Uh, 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 Donald Trump had the opportunity to call the National Guard. These are actual people who are supposed to come in and stop insurrections. He didn't. Mike Pence called the National Guard. We need to know why. And we need to know what, if anything, Trump was doing to protect the American right. government during the hours that it was under attack. And had this been slightly more effective, and I use that word precisely, Mike Pence would not have been in a position to do that. There, he, was, he was in mortal yeah. danger. Um, Ellie and Michael, thanks to both of you.